So good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is going to be the second lecture for today. It's going to be about reinforcement learning. It's supposed to be an introductory lecture for this topic, which actually will be extended next Monday with a talk by Uriol Vinyals uh, out here at, at UPC. So first, I'd like to acknowledge the help by Miriam Belbe, who's a PhD student of mine who uh, deal with this topic last year and from which from who I learned a lot. And also, uh, Serena Young from Stanford University, I basically took the structure of today's lecture from her class. So if you want to watch it again and watch it from another perspective, I suggest that you just click on the video and you can see her class, which actually is extended. I'm just going to cover half of, of her class today in our lecture. This is the outline for uh, today. I'm basically going to first explain what it's reinforcement learning, what are the basic elements in one of these architectures, and what's different from the, the architecture we've seen so far on deep learning. Then I'm going to introduce what's a Markov decision uh, process, which is the, the framework that allows us to formulate these kind of problems, and the elements and, and functions that uh, they are defined uh, from the Markov decision processes. And then uh, we get into the deep learning part. So actually, it's not until uh, point four, until the, this fourth part, that deep learning gets into, into action. Okay? So wh what I mean is that reinforcement learning is a field of machine learning that has uh, been successfully, very successfully, quite successfully, lately because of deep learning. But there are many solutions for deep reinforcement learning which are not based on deep learning. And then finally, just very briefly, I'll give you some pointers to some software frameworks that you might want to use if you want to get into this reinforcement learning world. And finally, many other pointers to, to learn more uh, on this topic. So starting from the motivation, uh, we can define reinforcement learning by a way of programming agents by reward and punishment without needing to specify how the task is to be achieved. So these are uh, um, a, a definition from these authors from 96. And just notice that there are some new keywords that we haven't seen uh, so far. It talks about reward, and it talks about punishment, and it talks about agents, and okay, tasks. Maybe you, we had thought about that, but, but these are like new terms that we hadn't seen yet on this course on deep learning. So let's, the idea for today is that you, you get familiar to these topics and, and figure out how, we, how to integrate that with a deep learning framework. If you remember from my first lecture when I introduced the perception, actually I started uh, by showing this famous uh, Yalokon's cake, the forest cake, where he uh, referred to pure reinforcement learning as the cherry of that cake. So this means that that's a kind of machine learning from which uh, we expect the, our system to learn with very, very, very uh, little data. At least compared with other types of machine le learning, that, uh, that, you, uh, that exist. So, so far, you have mainly uh, talk, uh, seen in this course uh, solutions for supervised learning. So you have uh, pairs of uh, labels, and you want to estimate a function that, given some input data, will uh, predict that label. So you, you want to, to uh, estimate functions that, that make this mapping between input data to, to whatever output. And, um, I think that uh, Ramon actually mentioned the other day that there's, there are big issues on that because to, to do supervised learning, you need to have all these pairs of uh, data and labels, and, and collecting that, it's, it's pretty hard. Yeah? And that's why nowadays there's uh, many, many people who are actually exploring other uh, venues for machine learning, such as the unsupervised and predictive learning that would be like where we have most of the data. So we just have raw data with no needs of, of labels. And you're going to have a lecture on this, uh, I think, in two weeks. So you're going to have Santi Pascual about talking about unsupervised learning and generative uh, models. But today, I'm going to stick sorry, on the top one, on this one, on the cherry. Um, so here you have what I just mentioned. Um, so uh, you've, you've seen this already. So the idea of the reinforcement learning, that's where we are going to discuss, is we, we will also want to uh, estimate a function, a function f that will uh, generate some output uh, y, but but this function f will not the, the goal will not be actually to 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 predict y, but to solve 
something else, some, so another charge. So actually, this other goal will be actually to maximize uh, something we'll call a reward, but it's not actually that the, the reward, it's the output of f. Okay, so f will, will uh, help us to, to move forward to get the best reward we can, but it will not directly give us the, the reward. That's, that's the tricky part. Uh, so we focus about reinforcement learning, um, in, as opposite to, to the supervised learning that you have seen so far. Let's go through a basic architecture for um, reinforcement learning. Um, so and I'll start with this uh, example. Maybe you've seen that. That's a network that is trained on reinforcement learning. So it's a, it's a, a machine that's playing this, uh, it was named the Brick uh, game, Arkanoid game. So the idea is that, that the control of this game is, is automatic. Okay? And it has been trained with a reinforcement learning agent. So just notice that at first the, it doesn't play very well, and then it begins learning how to do it better. Yeah? And the more training episodes, the, a, the agent, that's the name of the, of, the, of the system that's taking control of the, of the joystick, uh, is playing better and better and better. Yeah? So now he's doing quite a good job. And after many more, You see how now that the, the the system just becomes a pro, and actually it learns to put the table the ball uh, on top. So that's maximum score with minimum uh, effort, right? So maximum reward with minimum uh, action, and that's that's what these systems are aimed to do. Yeah, and that's actually this this example that you are saying it was kind of the the beginning of this explosion of deep learning, uh, deep reinforcement learning that, that, that we have, which is a, which is a sub, sub explosion in the, in the field of deep learning. Um, this paper was uh, published in Nature, actually, I think it was published in Archive a year earlier or so, and it's actually what I just shown you, and, um, it's, uh, it's the, the starting point of the company that Uriol Vignols will, will talk about. Uh, next month, which is Google DeepMind, but I'll, t I'll, I'll go back to the Google DeepMind uh, in the future. By now, as I'm going to follow this example of these uh, of video games, um, the basic idea, that I'll, basic example I'm going to follow is that we have uh, some uh, system that's called this DQN. I'll talk about it later, but it means uh, Deep Q Network, which is like the deep neural network that solve that. That, that task that I just presented. What it's doing this network, it's just looking at the pixels, looking at the row pixels, yeah? So screenshots of the, of the screen. And then he's applying uh, convolution uh, operations, which you well know. Uh, it has some hidden layers. And in the end, this network, uh, what it does, it, it predicts what uh, action to take, yeah? And with the action, it moves the, the control of, the, of this, well, of whatever, uh, uh, Player or sorry, whatever this game is, I think it's a spaceship this time uh, on, on the game. Yeah. So that's the example I'm going to follow just to explain the, the architecture which is coming next. So let's go for the uh, architecture. Um, so in this example of the of a video game, so we have a, a game console. So probably you, most of you don't even know what it's that, but that's that's a, a game video game console. Yeah. So that's the very beginning when I. When I, when I was playing video games when I was a kid, that's, that's uh, the first one I, that I play with, an, an Atari video game. So that's, Atari is an American company which no longer exists apart from marketing issues, I think. But, but it's a very nice uh, brand. But at that point, they, they did uh, video games. That was the video console. And that's in the field of uh, reinforcement learning that's called the environment. Yeah, so the environment, it's this computer that it's, in our case, it's uh, generating this this virtual world, in our, in our case, in this, the case of the video game, that, that's, that gen generates and controls this, this uh, wall. Jen, what does the environment provide? Um, so the first thing that the environment provides is a, a state. Yeah? And the state, uh, in this case of the video games, are the, the pixels, so the, the image that is uh, shown on screen. That's the state. And as the pixels, they evolve in time, this state depends on time, so that's why there's a ST here. Yeah, so row pixels in this example are is the state. So 
uh, in classic video game playing, so when humans play with the video games, uh, there's a human that will be looking at those pixels. And in the reinforcement learning uh, framework, this uh, human that will take decisions is called the agent, right? And actually, that's, that's the part that we want to simulate because it's a machine learning course, right? Um, so this agent just looks at the state, uh, and based on whatever uh, policy, actually that's something called policy that I'm going to talk later, so based on some policy, it will take a decision on which action to, to take. And in the case of video games, the action is just to move the, the joystick. And of course the action will, will change in time, so you, when you play video games, you, you do take different actions based on the different state that you that you see. This action uh, gets back to the computer, to the environment. And the environment, uh, depending on the action, uh, it will issue some reward to the agent or, or not. Okay? So, or, or maybe it will be a penalty. Right? And so in such a way, that that's will be one, how the agent will learn how to play video games. That's actually what probably all of you have have done when you've played video games. You when at the beginning you really don't play well at, at all, but based on the rewards that the system gives you, you, you learn how to play. Um, first thing we must uh, notice here is that this reward is given after the agent takes an action, yeah, and which is also a bit different from what we have seen so far, um, because actually you get the reward after your or exploit. It's closer to real life, but not that close to what we have seen so far in, in this course. And also, um, based on the action, so apart from the environment, apart from issuing uh, a reward or not to the agent, the environment will also update the, the state. So it will uh, probably uh, somehow will, will, will change the state of, of its state. Um, and this state can be influenced by the actions of the agent. And, and then the cycle just goes on and on and on, and that's how the, the formality of, of, the, of the reinforcement learning uh, uh, wall is formulated. The goal for the agent is to complete the game with, a, in this case, to complete the game with a, the with a highest score. And so that's, that's how we learn to play video games, and how, that's how the, the system I show uh, learn to, to play as well. Uh, another way to f of formulating uh, this goal is that the agent must learn how to take actions uh, that will maximize the accumulative reward. Um, so what I mean with accumulative reward is that in this video game, the point is to, to get the uh, highest score at the end of the game. Okay? It's not at 10 seconds or 20 seconds or 30 seconds. Not at, not, not at that specific moment. Right? You want to have a score at the very end. And that's what makes things quite challenging, right? Because probably that requires some planning. So when, when we had the brick thing, so first you maybe maybe at the short term uh, digging a hole on the side of the bricks, maybe that's not the, the 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 optimal way to at that point to get the highest reward. But in the long term, that's that's the best option, right? And that's what makes things a bit more tricky as well with reinforcement learning because the, the reward is actually the accumulative, like the one that will. Uh, the one at the very end, the one that you accumulate after playing the whole game, not just that in the middle. <clears throat> there have been, so there, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, reinforcement learning has been out there for a long time. There are many other problems that have been formulated as reinforcement lear learning problems. Uh, other ones, like for example, are this one is quite classic, that's called a card pole problem, and in this case, uh, the problem is you have an, oscill an oscillating uh, pole on a moving cart, and the goal is to uh, pushing uh, the cart uh, horizontally to keep the pole uh, like vertical. Yeah, that's the, the goal of the of the problem. And, and again, this can be formulated as an Asian environment that interact. For example, the environment in this case will provide as a state the angle, the angular speed, the position, or the horizontal velo velocity of the cart, then the agent can, as I said, that it can uh, apply force horizontally 
on the card in each side. And if you want to train a system to do that, uh, one solution that you could have is to pr uh, provide uh, plus one reward, just one coin or whatever, one unit of reward, uh, every time that the pole is upright. So if, if you do that, you might manage to, to train a, uh, an agent that will actually learn that, that as, uh, as he will, will try to maximize the reward, he'll try to keep the, the pole as, as vertical as possible. Another option, uh, which is much more modern, uh, would be just to have a, a robot to move around. Um, in this case, in this example, I, th I think that's also from, uh, I can't remember, from OpenAI, I think, and, and Berkeley. That's, uh, the, the goal is to have a robot to move forward. And in this case, uh, so that could be the robot. What you do is instead of building a real robot that might break uh, right or you, um, all the mechanical issues what you do is you, you build a virtual environment and then you train your agent in a virtual environment that's quite very common in 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 reinforcement learning yeah instead of i mean maybe in the end you will build the robot but if you want to train it for you want to do something virtual because then you have you have like uh, infinite simulations for free or, or at least much cheaper so in this case what will be the state uh, the state could be the angle and the position of the joints of this robot and you have the uh, sorry yeah the environment just tells you tells you what's the angle the the agent uh, uh, applies torques on on the joints so it can control all, all, all torques of the, of the joints and again if we want this uh, robot to to walk forward you want the robot to be uh, upright and to move forward yeah that's what we like to do and I'll show you a video of how they uh, how the, this robot uh, evolves. So beginning, uh, it's really bad, yeah. But after some iterations, uh, just by giving the reward, okay, just a few more iterations, by giving rewards to the robot, it manages to to do what we want to, right? To to move forward. Very impressive. Um, just notice that in this case, um, there is nobody programming. Nobody program what the joints had to do. Okay, that's another robot that they have. It's like a spider, and again, the the goal is is the same one, right? And here again, the trick is that nobody is really thinking. Oh, you you must move this joint, and after this one, then the other one. Just say okay. Mm, you're, if you move forward and you are bright, you get a reward. If not, you don't get it. And ju you just let the system to learn the, the complexity of the system, the complexity of the joints, because that's, of course, that, that requires some coordination, right? So that's pretty, if you want to program that manually, that will be pretty scratch. Okay. <laughs> I guess he's trying to stand up right now. Yeah. So let's go to the not so fun part, which are the equations that govern all these uh, control systems. Um, so the framework to formulate reinforcement learning uh, problems are Markov um, decision processes. Uh, probably you are familiar with them. And here the basic assumption is that um, the current state completely characterizes the state of, of the world. You don't care about what will happen in the past or in the future, just current state, it, it's enough for you to characterize everything in the world, which is kind of the opposite of what Marta just explained, where he explained networks where that had, had memory, that actually they, the memory was in, important. In this case, like at that time, frame, that's, that's, all, that's all you need to know about the world to solve this problem. That's a, of course, that simplification, that probably that's enough for, for this problem. Um, then, um, we're going to use the, the, f the following um, notation. Um, we're going to call S as the set of all possible states. So in, again, I'll, I'll follow the, the story of the video game. So in our case, the S would be all possible uh, screens that could be painted by the, by the console. Yeah? 
so all possible configurations of uh, invaders and spaceships and shots, all, all of them. That's the whole set of S. Uh, a is the set of possible actions. So classically, at least in this, in this game, as far as I remember, it was uh, right, left, and button, which was to shoot, as far as I remember. Maybe there was something else. Um, then R is a distribution of uh, rewards given a, a, a pair of a state of action, right? So given a, a state on a state an, an action, you can kind of have a, a, some different rewards, and you can estimate that. Um, P it will encode the transition probability. So this means the, the distribution over the next, the next state given a state ex action pair. So if, if you are, at, if you are uh, looking at the screen at that point and you take an action, uh, what's, what's the, what's the which, which are, how to model which are the new steps that you can uh, go to, which could be more than one, depends on the, what the, what the the video game, how it's coded, how, how the, the environment will, will evolve. And then finally, there's this gamma that's called a discount factor. Um, that's going to be very useful because um, in, in many cases, so apart from uh, trying to, trying the agent, apart from uh, aiming at having the highest commodity reward, trying to, to get the, the highest score in the video game, what we will want as well is to reach there as soon as possible. Yeah? So you, at the beginning with, with, the, with the bricks that, that you put the, the, the ball on top to have the highest score very, very quickly. Yeah? So if we want to do it quickly, we need some factor there that will tell us that if we take more steps, that's bad. That's going to penalize us. And that's what this gamma uh, will be modeling. You'll see it now in the, in the next equations. Yeah, but it will kind of penalizing uh, that a discount factor that will will uh, force the agent to solve the task in as as quickly as possible, or or sorry, uh, achieving the highest reward as as quick as possible. So um, in a Markov decision process, what we have is at start uh, there's a sampling for initial state, whatever screen, then the agent uh, selects an action. And based on the action, the environment will select a new state. So that will be looping. And also based on the action, the environment will uh, provide a reward. Uh, here, the, the key, and actually what, what we want, so that the key to all this system, uh, what we want to solve is um, to provide what's called a policy to the agent. So that's like some guidelines, some instructions for the agent to know which are the, the actions to take. To, to maximize the, the reward at the very end. Yeah? The, 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 key word, the key name is policy. And it's uh, modeled by, by, by P. And uh, this poly allows uh, the agent to choose an action based on a certain state. And as it's a Markov decision process, like as based with, with the current state, that's all we need to know. So that's what the, the uh, agent will, will need to apply the policy. So now with this word policy that we have introduced, I can reformulate the previous goal. We had the previous goal that we want the, the agent to learn how to take actions to maximize the reward. Now uh, with this MDP formality, now we want is to find a policy, optimal. So this, this star here will mean like the optimal policy that maximizes the Cumulative discounted reward. So okay. So now here you have the R T is the reward. So that's that's remember that the R T is the reward at each time step. Um, but then we have you have this gamma that was a discount reward. Uh, sorry, discount factor. Which actually what, what it does is that um, it will um, it will kind of de decrease the reward in time. So gamma is could be smaller than one. Yeah. So the the, the the longer it takes, uh, so the, the, the longer, the more time steps we take, uh, this factor uh, will be smaller. So this will make the the reward that you get from that from that uh, that time step to to lose value, right? This, this will force to to have rewards as quickly as possible.
there are uh, so th there are, uh, there's this problem which is also very classic in reinforcement learning architecture that's called the uh, the grid wall and will it will allow me just to explain a little bit about states and actions okay it's just an intermediate step before going forward with the formulas um, in this grid wall problem the goal is to reach one of the terminal states uh, so that's the one grey out, grey out, the ones with the star, in the least number of actions. Yeah. Um, if if you want to solve the problem, so in, just notice that. Uh, so each each of the cells in the grid is a state. And so yeah, here it is. So each of the cells, the cells in the grid is a state. That's what the environment uh, uh, describes. And then the agent can take different actions. It can move uh, right, left, up, or down. So, you, so you, the agent is in, in some state, always, is, or is observing some state, and then it will take some action to uh, solve the task, which in this case is to go to a terminal uh, node. The way to train a system to, to solve this task will be to provide um, a negative reward for each transition. So actually, in this case, uh, what it's what the, the 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 reward the the reward that we provide will just directly force the agent or, or push the agent to go as quickly as possible to the terminal node. It, that, that will not uh, it will the agent will have a penalty if if it just goes walking around without reaching the terminal node. Yeah, so you would force the the agent to go to the terminal node. Um, if if we consider, so just remember that the way the, the instructions that the agent or the criteria that the agent follows to, to solve the task, it's what's called a policy. Yeah? Now here we have an example of something called a random policy. Random policy will be like in, in, in every state, uh, so in, for each of the cells in the grid, um, you take one action in a, in a random manner, and that's how we represent here with the arrows. And of course, that's that will not. Uh, I, gu I guess that all of you should be aware that this is not the the, the way to have the highest reward. Yeah, because you you'll be just. Well, I mean, you you might end up in a in a terminal node, but that's probably not going. You will not get the highest reward possible. Yeah. So that's the random policy in this case is not the optimal policy. Yeah. So what would be the optimal policy? That's for you to think now. So I'll give you one minute to decide the optimal policy uh, to solve this problem. What you have to do? What you have to do is to consider each and single, each and every state, and draw with uh, arrows, right, left, up, down, which are the the actions that will be considered in the optimal policy. There might be more than one. Okay, so some states have more than one actions that that are part of the uh, optimal policy. Yeah, so I'd like to solve this now. I'll give you one minute. Do you have paper? Or if no, you don't have paper anymore. Well, if you have paper, you can solve it. If not, you think about it or discuss with your colleagues. No, no. So the the goal is, if you you are in a state, and you want to reach one terminal state, but in as few steps as possible. So so just to get uh, the highest reward possible. So every time you take a step, uh, every time you you get a step, you get a penalty. Let's say. Okay. So you want to take as few steps as possible, but but you can reach any of the two terminals. You, no, you never mind. Never mind which which of the two. Yeah. So you, you must think, okay, if I'm here, what, is the, what, action, what actions are part of the optimal, optimal policy if I'm here? Then you draw them, and then you say, okay, if, but if, if, I'm, if I'm in state here, what, what, which are the actions that are part of the optimal policy? And just consider that for each possible state. Yeah? One state is one cell. And, and you think which actions are 
part of the optimal policy. And in one, and in one state, there can be more than one action. Okay. Yeah, so don't know if you have solved everything, but at least you have, you've had time enough to think about if the problem is easy or difficult or, or nonsense or it does. So that would be the, the solution you should have come out, more or less. Yeah. Um, so in every, so you see that if in some of the states, um, it's quite obvious, especially for the neighboring ones. Um, maybe in some other states is one. From here, you, you need two steps to reach one of the terminal options. So that's one, two, uh, one, two, and that's it. Just notice that, that given a state, there can be more than one actions that take you to the, to the highest reward, highest cumulative reward. Okay? And that's the kind of problems that you, we want the agent to solve. Yeah? So just imagine that you need to program an agent that needs to solve this. Yeah? And just notice the, the challenge that for Given a state, there might be more than one uh, option. And OK, that was kind of an easy problem, because at least here, uh, yeah, okay, the stars are, are, are not moving. And, and when you do an action, that's not changing where the stars are. But if they were moving, that things would be, get more complicated. OK, um, so now that you know what the optimal policy is, so the optimal policy is, is for this problem is this. Right, so the actions that take you uh, to the maximum cumulative reward, and in that case is kind of easy, but some others are really not that obvious to solve. Um, how can we formulate the the finding of the optimal policy? So, um, as there are some randomness, like we saw, for example, that the the, the, the agent uh, in the previous example it could take different uh, actions going to the dust, into that uh, into the the best direction, but there ca there of course in the states there can be many different states uh, like the, the computer when it when it generates the the pixels when it uh, simulates the game it can take different decisions that we are not aware. Yeah. Um, then as there's some randomness there, we'll need to uh, deal with uh, expected summary rewards uh, because we don't have a certainty. Uh, of what's going to happen. So the, what we'll say is that the, the optimal policy is the policy that will uh, maximize the expected commodity discounted reward. That's the, the, the basic um, uh, criteria to choose the optimal policy. And, then we, and now we will develop from here. Um, OK. I give you a few definitions now, and now I'll go back to how to uh, how to explain how to find the optimal policy, right? First this definition, uh, that's the value function. The value function is, tells you um, how good a state S is for a given policy uh, pi. So you have here that this value function is the expected commutative reward from following the policy pi from state S. That's uh, this V value function is a expected, and it's the cumulative reward. So you have all the rewards with a discount factor, um, considering that you, we're starting from this, uh, from this current state and following this, this policy. Yeah? So this V tells you how good the state is for a given policy. Another definition, it's the Q value, value function. So this is just the value function. It only considers the state, but if you consider pairs of state and actions, then what you have is a Q value function. And in this case, the, the definition is very, is very similar to the previous one. Um, the Q value function uh, tells the expected cumulative reward from taking action A and state S, and then following the policy pi. Yeah, so you have the expected uh, cumulative reward, and the, it's like the uh, starting from this state and this action and following policy by.
So if now we, um, so that's, if, the, that's the, if Q is the expected commutative uh, reward and we want to have the, 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 the maximum amount of reward, actually what we would like to, to know is how, how can we find the optimal Q value function at state S and action uh, A. There's a missing A here. So that's what we would like to, to find. So given a, a pair of state and action, um, what's, what's, what's the policy that we want, uh, that we should take to have the maximum co expected commutative reward? What we're going to do, so we're going to choose the, the policy that maximizes uh, this, ex this expected value. <coughs> In order to formulate this, uh, this process of choosing the, the policy that maximizes this uh, community, community of reward, uh, we are going to use uh, something called a Bellman equation that's a well-known equation for control systems. And basically what um, this equation um, presents is that um, the maximum expected commutative reward for starting from this pair, it's part of the reward that we get. So it's an expectation across all possible future states, which is kind of a way of introducing the randomness, but it's a function from the uh, reward that you get from the uh, considered state and action, and also from the maximum expected commutative reward for the future states. So actually you, ca you kind of say like the, the, best, the best that I can get from this state and action is, uh, the best commutative reward is the reward that I have now and the best reward that I can have uh, considering the, the, the future, uh, the possible future state and actions. And that's kind of the way of, of how this equation works. So now, um, if we want to find uh, the policy that, that maximizes this discounted reward, actually, what we, what, so this is the same equation, okay? Right? I'm just highlighting different things. So just the same equation, it's still the, the Bellman equation. But just notice that um, if you want uh, to take, to achieve the maximize uh, commutative discount reward, what you're going to take are the actions that maximizes the, uh, also the expected com commutative reward in the future, which is kind of a bit obvious, but that's how the formalism works. So as this is going to maximize uh, the, the value, uh, we can, um, so just remember that, that, that we reach here um, as, as reformulating this, the, trying to find the maximum policy. So in the end, what it tells us that the ultimate policy corresponds to taking the best action in any state according to, to this function, this Q value function. The problem here is how to estimate this Q. Yeah, because estimating, so this, this Q function, like given a state and action, uh, tell me what's the best re reward I can get. That's, okay, how, how do you estimate that? That's, that's very complicated, right? And, and one way to do it, it's something called the value iteration algorithm, which uh, basically what you do is you do it in an iterative way. So you, you will try to estimate this uh, Q function a different, uh, in, a, in an iterative way. Yeah? So I, in this case, it, it means that uh, we are trying to, to estimate this Q function. And the, the idea is that if, if uh, we are able to iteratively estimate this Q function uh, in an iterative manner, and we, can, and we iterate until infinity, this uh, estimation will match the, the actual optimal, um, uh, optimal uh, Q value. So doing, doing that, so trying, trying to uh, really um, estimate all possible, uh, um, so trying to, to estimate the, the commutative reward for all the possible state and action pairs, that's actually it's a, it's, a, it's a good formalism, but in practice, that's not something that you can do, at least in, in this kind of problems, where we are dealing with uh, a, a huge amount 
of possible states. So maybe the actions, they might be the, the joysticks, but the states are huge. And if you, you would like to estimate the maximum commutative reward for every possible state, every possible pair of state and action, uh, that's huge. So remember that in this case, a state is the configuration of pixels. So all, all the screens, shots, let's say, that the computer console can generate. This means that you, you, you need to, the, the, the field to explore is, is huge, right? So um, in this case, um, this approach is not scalable. And what, uh, that's when deep learning comes to the rescue because um, the, the trick here is to train a network. These parameters here are the parameters from a neural network that will actually estimate this Q function, right? Um, so if we can train a network couple of, of, of approximating this function, then we'll be able to, to estimate the, uh, the commutative reward for every, every pair of state and action and, we'll, and as we, in the end, we'll take the actions that, um, that maximize this Q value, this Q uh, function, then we'll be able to, to take decisions for our agent. And that's what, what uh, actually what deep Q networks do, and that's the revolution in deep learning for this kind of task. So now we're going to get into details with this deep, how the ne deep neural networks are applied in this, in this context. That's called deep Q learning. That's the, uh, okay. So um, what could we do if, if we had a, so remember that our, our problem is that we want to estimate, estimate this function, this, uh, an estimation of the, Bellman, um, of the Bellman equation, approximation of it. We we'll need to have is to train a network that given uh, whatever state and action. Uh, here there's more than one state because um, in this, in the, okay, in the paper from that presented this DQN, what they did is instead of showing only one frame, they showed the, I think the, the four frames, four, the last four frames of the, of, the, of the video game, okay? But you can consider it's one state. So you have a state and action, you allow the network to predict the, the Q value. How can you do that? We can formulate that uh, with a, a loss function where we are going to, uh, we want to, to have a network. So that's the, that's the neural network, the function we want to approximate, it's over here, and we want, we want it to approximate um, the Bellman equation. That would be like the, the Bellman equation uh, as we're doing it in an iterative, in an iterative manner. So we have the, the parameters of the network in, in previous state. So we want um, to, to, to train a network that will in the end um, might uh, approximate the Bellman equation. That's what we have here. And that's again the same. Just notice that to train a network that will uh, approximate the Bellman equation during training, uh, it will be necessary to compute the reward uh, for, the, the, for the current uh, state action. Yeah, that's, that's on that, that will be need to be done. So this means that if, if you really want to train a network that estimates the maximum uh, reward that you, can, you want to obtain for each state, you actually will need to have the video game playing and giving you the rewards so you can actually uh, put it here in the equation and compute the, the loss function. Okay, this uh, function is differentiable, so here you have the gradients if you want to take a look at it. And that's how, so we have everything, we have the, the loss function, we have uh, the the gradients for the gradient update for the backward pass that's already integrated in the frameworks that, that you that you can use and actually um, while this would be what I explained so far if you look at the at the paper that proposed this work they did something slightly different so they, they did the following what they did is instead of uh, having a network that you have as input the state and all possible actions like uh, the screen and uh, joystick up, a screen, joystick down, a screen, and joystick left, right, whatever. What it is, is they just put the state as the input, so the, the screenshot, actually like four screenshots. And in the output, they, uh, they predicted the Q value for uh, each of the different actions. 
to be considered. Yeah, and this way, so what they have the screenshots, they put, they pick the Q value for the for the different actions, and what they will actually when you play, what you choose is the Q value with which is higher. The highest Q value is the action that you actually take when you when you are training the system, or or when you're playing, right? Maybe when you maybe when you train you do other things, but at least when you when you're actually playing, and you did this also in only one single feed forward pass. Because if you if you did the the other approach, you would need to, oops, to have a fit a fit forward pass for uh, each of the different actions for each of the joystick movements. So that's a network <coughs> that they that they design, um, or one of them. I think they design because they play with different Atari games. That's that's one of them. Again, as I show later, they had convolutions. They had. Uh, Relo activations, convolutions, fully connected layers, and in the end, they predicted the Q values for the uh, different uh, action. In this case, the actions were the joystick moves and joystick move com uh, combined with the with the press button. Uh, so the number of actions uh, range from uh, four to eighteen, depending on the video game, because they played that with for different Atari video games. Here you have the details of of one of the networks where the output is. Uh, there are four, four uh, actions, uh, and here and again I mentioned again this thing of the four frames. If you train one of these systems, uh, there's a very good practice to follow, which is something called experience replay. So I'm going to mention that uh, whether it's I guess that if it's a deep learning system, it's it's more important. Which is that. Uh, if you try to train one of these networks with uh, consecutive samples, so you, you have your system playing the game and you go training your, your network, you will have problems because your, your samples, um, which are consecutive, they are quite similar and they might be correlated. And also, um, as actually the, the next uh, samples, so next observations of state and action that you show to the network, they are conditions from your previous um, Actions. Uh, it may happen that maybe your network uh, have a bias to move the joystick always to the right, yeah. Uh, and then uh, it kind of, by if if in the past you move the joystick to the right, then in the future it can it will have it might have the bias to move it there. And in the end, you will not have samples of what happened if you, if I move the joystick to the left, which might be also useful because maybe then you you learn uh, a, a a better uh, policy. So it's important that um, that um, to solve these problems, uh, you introduce this thing called experience replay, which in actually what you do is okay, you, you, you have your system playing the video game, and uh, first you store the observations that you have. So you, you, you save, you record what you did. Um, so you you have a memory table where you store the, the transitions that, that you have and, and the rewards. And so that's what it plays. But then when you train, you don't train sequential uh, uh, actions, uh, state, act uh, state action sequences, but you just uh, create, uh, you choose your samples randomly. And then you create mini batches to train your network uh, this way. From, so you, you, you go to your memory table, you take some uh, random samples, and that's how you train your network. And then you, you let it play, you will get more samples, you store them on your uh, memory. And again, and for 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 training, you you take uh, some new samples and, and you train again. Yeah, so that's that's quite very important. Otherwise, it you will have problems to to train your network. <coughs> so if you want to see how one of these systems works, uh, you can click on this link, I think, and it runs a reinforcement learning in your your browser. Um, also, I like to uh, mention one of the the work that we had here at with Miriam Bejbe. So now it's it's more about some examples. So, um, this example, what, what we did here at UPC was to have a informal learning agent that was able to um, locate an object on an image by doing zooms. Yeah. So, so we 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 have the image. We, we zoom in one uh, area of the image, and then we zoom again, and then we zoom again. So, in the end, we we found the object, and in in this case, um, our state was the, the, 
the features from the convolutional uh, layer of, of, the, of the region that we had crop because we were like zooming in. Yeah, so that would be the, the state. It was changing. Uh, so actually, we took two, two, we took two architectures. So you sh should look at, at this one. Uh, when we did the zoom, so of course, every time you, you zoom, uh, the features on the convolutional la layer, they, they, they change. So the state was changing. And then uh, we, in our case, we also use something called a history vector that's quite common as well. So when you have your, this will be the, the Q network in the end that takes the decision on, on where to zoom. But so we have our uh, visual features here from the image. But we concatenated another uh, feature over here, which is the history vector, which is a way of introducing memory. Yeah. So again, now going back to the lecture from Marta, Marta was uh, already presented a, a network that naturally uh, uh, introduced memory. And actually, in the recurrent neural networks, you don't have to tell them how big your memory should be. In, in our case, in this network that we built, we actually uh, chose, I think it was a size, I think it was size 6, but I'm not really sure. So we will, or maybe it's 24. Maybe 24. So we, 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 cho we, we save the previous decision that, that, that we took. Okay, for a for a for a fixed window length, and that helps as well. So we, we define rewards based on how well our zoom was matching the the object. So the, because the goal was to to find the object, in uh, and then uh, that's the kind of movements that we have. So you have here uh, this was a plane. Uh, we had different instead instead of allowing the system to go around uh, widely, uh, we also just only provide some some. Uh, one, two, three, four, five uh, possible actions to zoom center or, or zoom in the four corners. And a final action, which would be the blue, to say, OK, I found the object. That would be the, the trigger <coughs> action. And that's, okay, that's one of the examples that, that we have, where we see that the agent uh, learned to focus on, on, the, on the object. If you want to play with it, you can just click here, and there's a source code there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a that's a way. Um, it, it's quite a common practice to to do it, but um, it seems to help the system to to train better. Okay, just to finish now about uh, if you want to play with re uh, reinforcement learning, there are some frameworks, uh, software frameworks that you can uh, play with. One of them it's called uh, OpenAI Gym. OpenAI is a kind of a big non-profit compa company um, with uh, one of the most famous one in reinforcement learning. And they have an, an environment there to, to train reinforcement learning agents. And there's a connector with Keras that helps uh, using this, this package with, from Keras. It's called Keras RL. Actually, OpenAI has another uh, framework called uh, Universe where they have plenty of video games, and you can train your agents to play uh, against them. If you want to learn more, um, here there are some uh, introductory videos to show your family, I guess, and friends, because they are like very friendly. Uh, he's a, if you don't, so so th this is a series, Deep Learning TV, there's a series of very friendly uh, videos that will give you an overview of deep learning, and Sirai, Raval, it's one of the most famous YouTuber on deep learning. How many of you know that, know him? Okay, great, good job. So he's a celebrity. You know him probably better than me. Um, then, if you want all the people who are famous but not YouTubers, there's this course from Stanford, all in reinforcement learning. So here we just we'll give you two hours and a half of reinforcement learning. So, but there are like just courses on reinforcement learning. So it's been a a very long and extensive uh, research field. This is one from David Silver, from uh, Nando de Freitas. Actually, there are some lectures in when he was in Oxford. Uh, Peter Avila and John Schumann from Berkeley and OpenAI. Also, uh, I would suggest that you look at this kind of algorithms, the actual critic algorithms. I didn't have time to go through them, but they are also quite important. Uh, evolutionary strategies. And that's it for. Now, just a uh, final idea, just remember, I hope that at least now, uh, if you didn't get lost from the, occasion, the equation, that 
you have an idea that transformer learning is another way for doing machine learning, that it has some particularities compared to supervised learning, also compared to unsupervised, but you haven't done unsupervised yet, so it's more difficult for you to, to see the difference, but it, you'll see it when Santi explains it. And uh, in this case, there's no supervision. Feedback is delayed, so you, get, you want to, to maximize the, the final reward, not the instantaneous one. And uh, time really matters, so it's, there's a sequence of actions. So coming next, on Monday, uh, you have a Supermaster lecture. Um, I'll give you just a very brief introduction to this lecture. So this DQ network from Atari games that I presented, actually it was developed by some researchers in London, some English researchers, who did this nice work under a company called DeepMind. And after doing this work, there was, the company was acquired by Google, uh, 400 million pounds. Then I can see 2014. And, and they are the creators of many very nice works, like probably you've seen this uh, work from uh, AlphaGo, which is that this computer that uh, has beaten uh, the best humans playing this Go game, which is super complicated, requires very long term planning. Um, there's a movie, a documentary. I'm not really sure if it has been released here. Has anybody seen that? No? OK, so there's, I don't, we, we'll ask Uriol where is, if we can watch it s somehow. Um, but this, it was released last spring, I think. Um, they have, uh, Uriol will talk a, a lot about uh, StarCraft II. So probably many of you know about that. So that's a video game that also requires a lot of planning. He's a big fan of, the, of it. So now he has a framework to train reformer learning agents to play StarCraft II. And he will tell you about the details. Um, yeah, so Monday, uh, next Monday, uh, you should have registered online. So, we, so we're going to be many more people than when we are now here. So we, we just had to, to change twice rooms. So first it was in Aula Master, the talk. It's not any longer in Aula Master, okay? Then it was in the Salactas in IFC Vertex for 160 people. It's not any longer in the Salactas. So the next room that we have is uh, L'Auditori in Vertex. That's for 477 people. I hope that everybody can take a seat there. <laughs> right now we have like 200 registered uh, people. So feel free to, now we have seats, so feel free to promote uh, between your friends and colleagues. I think it's going to be a very nice talk. Uh, so it's going to, there's going to be an introduction by Yanis Kalantis from Facebook Research. It's going to be a short one that will explain just how Facebook is using this technology that we are presenting in this course in their work. And then it's going to be like the, the big lecture from Uriol Vinyals on reinforcement learning and DeepMind and, and something else, which I'm not really sure. Okay, so see you there on Monday. Uh, no, but now we have a break and we talk about the project. So you stay here. Okay, take a 10 minutes break.